Okay, so we're here today at the Natural History Museum of Utah in Salt Lake City, and uh, Dr. Kenneth Lacavera is here, and he was a visitor at the museum today, and he's gracious enough to speak with us. Um, Dr. Lacavera has a new book coming out. Let's see if I can do all this. Why don't you hold it up? There you go. Um, called Why Dinosaurs Matter. It's based off of a TED Talk you did last year? 2016, in yeah. 2016. And we'll talk a little bit about the book and, um, and what's going to be in there. That comes out September 19th, is that correct? September 19th, uh, Simon & Schuster. Uh, you can pre-order now on Amazon. Okay, excellent. So go on Amazon when you see this video and get his book because it looks like a really good one. So um, let's start off with the title of the book, Why Dinosaurs Matter. Why do they matter? That's a big question that you have a whole book answering. But. Sure, you know, I think um, dinosaurs matter because the future matters. Uh, right. Everyone, even paleontologists, are more concerned with the future than they are with the past, but we don't have access to the future. We can do no experiments in it. Um, we can never go there to collect data. Really, all we're ever going to know about the future is by looking at the past. So if we want to understand this environmental future that we're sailing into with these multiple existential crises that humanity is facing, the global climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis and sea level rise and you know desertification, right. We have to look to the ancient past to see what has happened on our planet before and to see how ecosystems and, and how geological systems respond to these things. Um, let's see. So based on, on that answer, can you talk about how inevitable was the present or is the present based on what's come before us? I love that question, Jim. And, um, the, our, our present, our future right now is not inevitable. There are an infinite number of presents that we could have had, right? But we only get one. Right. And you go back, you turn the clock back four and a half billion years and you run the movie again and it's never going to happen the same way twice. As I point out in the book, shift the continents one way or another and the winds across northern Africa go to the east or go to the west. Humans evolve or do not evolve, depending on whether grasslands uh, come from forests or, or not. You know, you uh, kill off an inconspicuous wolf-like creature on the ancient shores of Pakistan 38 million years ago, and today, there are no whales. You know, that little uh, space rock. The so asteroid. an ancient wolf, explain the connection to whales there. Yeah, so um, there's a really beautiful transitional fossil record of, of ancient um, carnivores that lived on the southern shore of Asia, and you can see they're becoming semi-aquatic. You see maybe they had webbed feet, longer snouts, their sensory organs start to move up to the top of their head because they're swimming. Um, and then you see them go to mostly aquatic. And then you basically have whales like Basilosaurus. It's a whale, but it still has little legs. And then you see the legs go away. But none of these things would have happened. The largest creature to ever live on Earth, the blue whale, would not have happened if that ancient wolf-like animal went extinct in Pakistan before it had a chance to uh, leave descendants. OK, that's pretty cool. Um, one of the things I talk about when I tour people here through our Past Worlds Gallery is all of the new species that we have on display here in the gallery. And I always talk about how cool that is, but can you expand on that, like beyond cool? Like, um, I know the rate of discovery of dinosaurs has really increased over the last, what, 50 or 60 years. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that and why it matters. Sure, um, if you go back 100 years ago, the turn of the last century, the rate of discovery of dinosaurs was about one species a year. By the time we got to 1970, it was about six species. Last year, in 2016, 36 new dinosaur species were found. So part of this is because the world population is greater, so some percentage of those people are paleontologists and they're out there looking, but it's also that the world is much more connected now. China has opened up, Mongolia has opened up, and so paleontologists can get to places that they only dreamt about before. And so we just have more and more paleontologists going to these far-flung corners of the world, finding more and more fossils. And there have been statistical studies looking at the rate of discovery of dinosaurs, and it has not yet peaked. And we're probably only a third to halfway there, if that, uh, as far as the number of dinosaur species are out there. I think, you know, not to put a bad pun out there, but I think we've only scratched the surface when it comes to dinosaur discoveries. Okay, and, and talk about how 
this rate of discovery and all these new species that we're finding, um, what does that say about the biodiversity of the past? Well, we can see a couple of things. One is that, you know, the past was richer and creatures were, were more varied and more exquisitely adapted than really we ever dared dream to imagine. The other thing we can see in the fossil record is that we get more and more species as we go through time. Periodically, the, the number of species is knocked back in a mass extinction like happened at the end of the Cretaceous period. But over time, the number of species increases. There, there are twice as many species on the planet now as there were just before the dinosaur extinction happened. And that's because organisms over time, they get better at two things. They get better at not going extinct, right? Because mm -hmm. the ones that do don't leave progeny. Um, and they get better at partitioning the resources in ecosystems. So we see more and more spe specializations occur throughout geological time. Okay. And then um, let's talk about that KT boundary in the end of the yeah. Cretaceous. I yeah. understand you uh, have a lot to say about that, so go ahead. Yeah, so uh, 66 million years ago, uh, an asteroid uh, about the size of Salt Lake City going probably 40,000 miles an hour, that's 25 times the speed of a bullet, it, it hits off the Yucatan Peninsula and blasts a hole in the ground that's about the size of the state of Massachusetts. Imagine what Massachusetts weighs, maybe by 20 miles deep. Take that mass, throw it up through the atmosphere, let those particles orbit the Earth a couple of times. You've given it a tremendous amount of potential kinetic energy, right? gravitational energy. When that stuff re-enters the atmosphere, it's got to balance the energy books. And it does that in part by sound and on impact, but mostly by heating up the atmosphere through friction on its way back in. So right now the argument in geophysics is the temperature that day for a couple hours got up to the temperature of a toaster oven or some say for a few minutes got up to the temperature of a pizza oven. Either way your dinosaurs are dead. And that's for the whole planet. That's for the whole planet globally. So what we see that day literally if you're living on the surface and you don't have a place to hide, if you can't get in a hole, get in a cave, get underwater, you're cooked that day. You may survive if you can shelter that day, but then all that dust in the, and gas in the atmosphere blocks out the sun, photosynthesis breaks down, and things start to starve. So we really have two parallel mass extinctions, one because of the heat on land and one because of the breakdown of the food chain in the ocean. And the result is that about 75% of species on the planet go extinct in what looks like a geological instant. And the evidence of that has been found through proxies for meteor impact, shocked quartz, uh, little beads of glass that rain down from the sky, some other things. That layer called the KT boundary or now called the KPG boundary by some. Okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, hmm. it's evolving. Um, <laughs> that layer has been found in over 300 spots around the world, but fossils have never been found in that layer. So at the Edelman Fossil Park of Rowan University of New Jersey, where I'm the director, um, we have a bone bed of marine organisms and the occasional dinosaur in there. And we could see for years, we could see that it's near the end of the Cretaceous period. But what's close in geology? A thousand years is pretty close, or 10,000 years. But in the last few years, we've begun, to, we've begun to recover proxies for meteor impact right in that bone bed. And so this is a hypothesis that we're testing right now. That's how science works. You make a hypothesis, you try to poke holes in it, and then your colleagues will certainly try to poke holes in it when right. you publish. But it's looking pretty good for us. And, and I think we'll be publishing in the next year. And it looks to us like the only place on the planet where you can put your finger on, on a dead, fossil individual like a crocodile or a mosasaur and say that actual dude died in that pivotal calamitous day that wiped out the dinosaurs. The only place in the world where you can see that is in a fossil quarry in southern New Jersey. That's amazing. And so I heard it described today as sort of the Pompeii of the end of the dinosaurs, right? Yeah, that's right. This is sort of uh, the dinosaur apocalypse preserved. Okay. And uh, knowing that, we knew that we needed to preserve the property. It's 105 acres. Um, as a result of that, I went to Rowan University to become the founding director of the Edelman Fossil Park and also the, the new school of earth and environment, uh, of which I'm the dean. Um, uh, Gene and Rick Edelman, uh, who are alumni of the university, donated $25 million to the effort, an amazing gift. Right now we're endeavoring to build a $50 million uh, visitor center and museum on the site. We'll have 
amazing displays like you have here, uh, a nature trail, a paleontology themed playground, and importantly, um, people will be able to see science underway, but they'll also, there are layers above this where we can let the public collect. So everybody that comes to this site who tries a little bit and who isn't mm -hmm. afraid to get their hands dirty finds a 65 million year old fossil with their own hands that they get to take home. Wow, and that's, that's... we found that that's just a transformational experience for people when they when they make that personal connection between themselves and the place where they live in the Earth's ancient past. It does amazing things. Yeah, very very cool. Um, let's go back to your book for a second. Sure. And there's a couple things in there that I thought were cool. Uh, one is the question of uh, whether penguins are dinosaurs, right? Yeah. So let's talk about that for a second. Yeah, so there's a chapter in Why Dinosaurs Matter called Is a Penguin a Dinosaur? And, um, you know, all birds are in fact dinosaurs. And it's not correct to say that birds are closely related to dinosaurs. Birds are dinosaurs. Birds are dinosaurs to the, to the degree that a T-Rex is a dinosaur or a Stegosaurus is a dinosaur. Being a dinosaur is a binary condition. You are one or you're not. There are no degrees. Um, yeah. Just like we're humans, but we are also apes. We are also primates. We are also animals. You know, once you become a human, you don't get kicked out of the ape club or the primate club, right? right? And so it's the same with birds. Once birds evolved, they don't get kicked out of the dinosaur group. They still have those defining qualities that we look for in dinosaurs. And just like every other dinosaur, they can trace their ancestry back to the very first one. And if you have the first dinosaur as an ancestor, you're a dinosaur. Okay, and you talk about penguins specifically, so why, why penguins? I use penguins in the book simply because they look so much not like dinosaurs, right. you know, these kind of cute, blubbery creatures that, you know, almost at this point look more like fish than birds or dinosaurs. And it was to illustrate the point that no matter what um, morphological adaptations these, these animals have gone through in evolution, they can still trace their ancestry back to the first dinosaur. I thought about using hummingbirds. We could use hummingbirds as well. These little tiny creatures that weigh, you know, a third of an ounce are dinosaurs. Right. Okay. Um, another thing you talk about is um, the arms on T-Rex and how yeah. they're actually a key to the strength of T-Rex, which is sort of counterintuitive to a lot of people. Yeah, that's right. You know, there are countless internet memes and cartoons about the arms of T-Rex. You know, if you're happy and you know it all, never mind. Or um, uh, T-Rex, worst DJ ever. Or, you know, T-Rex can't answer the phone, can't put on its hat, things like that. Um, well, those tiny arms of T-Rex are actually related to the evolutionary pattern that made T-Rex this ferocious beast that dominated its ecosystem and has the most powerful bite ever found on a land animal. And the reason for this is if you're going to have a really big bite, you need a really big head, right? Mm -hmm. And if you're going to have a really big head with really big jaw muscles on that head, you need a really strong neck to hold up the head. And if you're going to have a really strong neck, you need big neck muscles. Where do neck muscles attach? They attach around the shoulder. Where do your arm muscles attach? They also attach to the shoulder. So neck muscles and arm muscles compete for the same muscle attachment space around the bones of the shoulder. So as the arms of T-Rex got smaller, it created an opportunity for its neck muscles to get bigger, creating the opportunity for its bite to get more and more powerful. So the next time you make fun of those T-Rex arms, just think about the murderous bite that they make possible, able to crunch a duckbill skull with a single chomp. Great. Those arms don't look so silly when you start to think of it like that. Okay, that's, that's a great perspective. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, <clears throat> okay, before we wrap things up, um, you are here visiting the museum today, yeah. and again, thanks for taking the time yeah, to talk to us. Um, can you talk about your impressions of this past world's exhibit? And for someone who's never been here, what would they see if they came to this museum? Well, I have to, uh, to tell you, Jim, I'm so impressed with what you've done here. I, I'm in the process now of looking at uh, museum design, and, and we'll be building a museum soon. And I've learned so much um, about how to do it right by coming here to the Natural History Museum of Utah. Um, it's, you know, it starts with just gorgeous, gorgeous architecture. And then the, the exhibits are really thoughtfully done. I think there's something for everyone here. You could be four years old, you could be 94 years old, and you're gonna be able to come here and learn and have fun and make some connection with Utah's ancient past 
and learn about you know the natural resources of our planet and evolution and it's just wonderful. I'm having a tremendous time and uh, I'm here with my wife and son on vacation actually and they're going to just have to pry me away from this place today so that we can get on with our road trip. And they did graciously loan you to us, which we appreciate. Um, any of the specimens in this gallery stand out to you as particularly interesting? Well, all of them. I, I mean, I imagine if you were born in Utah and grew up in Utah, you might not realize what a treasure chest of paleontological riches you're living in. And so, you know, all of these things here, the things from the Cleveland Lloyd Quarry, things from other parts of Utah, the Grand Staircase, um, you know, if you were to list like the top half dozen dinosaur hunting grounds on the entire planet, this is one of them. And so just amazing, amazing things that you have here. And amazing scientists like Jim Kirkland, the famous paleontologist, Lindsay Zano, who's just a wonderful person and I've never seen anybody work harder than her to get a dinosaur out of the ground. And um, just amazing people have contributed to these amazing collections here. Cool. And before you came today, had you ever heard of Lathernex or Justice? I'm not sure, but I think he's in the frame behind us. I, I had heard about it. I had never actually seen uh, the skeleton, so it's a thrill right. to be here. Yeah, I, I, I don't know what our paleontologists think of this, but I always think of him as Utah's T-Rex. He's a, he's a pretty impressive uh, dinosaur, so he's, he's, he's my favorite. So. Yeah, he's pretty scary. I would not want to meet him in a dark alley. Um, let's see, um, you uh, discovered Dreadnoughts, is that correct? Dread, did I say it wrong? Dreadnoughtus. Dreadnoughtus. Yeah. Can you talk about that dinosaur? Sure, I did. I discovered Dreadnoughtus in southernmost Patagonia, Argentina, down near Tierra del Fuego. Oh, I've been down there. That's yeah, gorgeous. It's it just is. gorgeous. Yeah. Um, I found Dreadnoughtus in 2005. I was prospecting for dinosaurs in the, in the badlands of Argentina. To do that, you want to find rocks of the right age. They have to be sedimentary rocks. And then today, it's very helpful if it's a desert. So you get good rates of erosion, good exposure. And then really, you just get yourself on the ground and you, you walk and you look for bones sticking out. And so I saw this little patch of bone about that big and that turned out to be a, a piece of the femur, the thigh bone of Dreadnoughtus. And you know actually I didn't get too excited because it's pretty common to find isolated bones and they're of limited scientific value. But we started to uncover that bone and pretty soon the shin bone was there and then uh, another leg bone, and then we saw 10 vertebrae. Oh, wow. And um, by the end of the day, we had a, over a dozen bones exposed, and then we were there for four more winters. I spent a total of a year uh, living in my tent uh, next to Dreadnoughtus in Patagonia, and after four hard, really long field seasons, um, we had 145 bones of this giant beast. So Dreadnoughtus is the, the most complete of the supermassive dinosaurs. And then it's hard to say exactly what the biggest dinosaur is because the, many of the biggest ones are from very fragmentary remains. What we can say right now is that Dreadnoughtus is the largest dinosaur for which we can confidently calculate its weight. And that weight is about 65 tons. How does that compare to T-Rex? That's the mass of nine T-Rex. That's the mass of 13 bull African elephants. That's about 10 tons heavier than a Boeing 737. And this is one dinosaur? One dinosaur. Okay. Now, actually, just yesterday, uh, a new titanosaur was published from northern Patagonia. They named it Patagotitan. And this is a huge, huge dinosaur. Um, but it's from six different individuals. So they have, they have the upper arm bone, the humerus, and the thigh bone, the femur. But they're from different individuals. Right. So it's hard to, to confidently calculate the weight from that. But it is in the dreadnoughtus category or maybe more, it's very, very large. Wow. And interestingly, that dinosaur shows signs that it wasn't yet fully grown, and Dreadnoughtus also shows signs that it was growing fast at the time of its death. And there are other dinosaurs that seem to be clustering in this 60, 70 ton range. Um, so we don't really know how big dinosaurs ultimately got, and you know what we know now is that these things are kind of like minimums for the, for the largest dinosaur now. I'm sure there are ones out there that are bigger. Okay. Um, you talk about how the word dinosaur is sort of uh, been equated to obsolete. And yeah. hearing you talk about big dinosaurs like that sort of reminded me of that 
um, discussion in your book. Um, talk a little bit more about that. I mean, should we think dinosaur equals obsolete? Yeah, so in Why Dinosaurs Matter, I talk about how, how did the word dinosaur, how did the concept of dinosaur become so closely associated with failure, right? You'll say, oh, that company is a dinosaur, that political party is a dinosaur. Well, they should hope to be so lucky, right? Global dominance for 165 million years. You know, if you think of, of business, what CEO wouldn't salivate over franchises popping up all over the world the way dinosaurs dominated and spread across the continents? What, what head of R&D wouldn't just revel in the development of, you know, feats of, of you know, unprecedented speed and size and innovation. And dinosaurs were astoundingly, astoundingly successful. The reason that they got kind of tarred with failure is that for so long, for so many decades, we didn't understand the terms of their demise. We thought that they just weren't good enough, weren't tough enough, that, that they died of their own degeneracy. You know, some people would say they, they simply went extinct because they were too dumb to live. Well, they were murdered. They were murdered by a space rock, right, that came yeah. from, from, from the outer, well, from, from the asteroid belt. And, you know, if you think about all the great people in history, well, imagine George Washington. Do we tarnish his legacy because eventually he died? You know, do we tarnish the legacy of Einstein because, you know, eventually his life ended? Right. Um, no, the, the accomplishments of the dinosaurs should stand forever and ever. And, you know, they, they were on the planet for 165 million years and the birds are still with us. If that asteroid didn't hit, why not another 65 million more? And so, you know, we got lucky, us mammals, because we spent all that time during the Mesozoic as these scared little shrew-like creatures trying to live in the, hark, uh, the dark and little noticed recesses of the dinosaur world. We'd still be there if it weren't for that space rock. Um, but we survived and then, you know, we grow up into these smarty pants mammals and then we kind of tarnish the legacy of the dinosaurs uh, uh, as a result. But It's pretty ironic. Um, remind our audience, how new is this um, hypothesis, I'm, I'm not sure if that's the right word, yeah. that um, an asteroid is what killed the dinosaurs? Yeah, so if you go back um, to the 1970s or before, Literally, no one has any idea what happens to the dinosaurs. And then in 1980, uh, Walter and Luis uh, Alvarez published this uh, asteroid hypothesis. And paleontologists hated the idea. One is that there were so many crackpot theories about what happened to the dinosaurs, and asteroids seemed like just another one. And I think, two paleontologists didn't want this enduring mystery of our field solved by some outsiders. Um, but then in... And what was their field? Um, uh, Walter is a geologist and his father, uh, Luis, was a Nobel Prize winning physicist. Okay. Um, and then in the 90s, early 90s, information came to light about the Chicxulub Crater, this giant impact crater off the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico, and that dated right back to that KT or KPG boundary, and then the pieces just started to add up. So I'd say that almost all paleontologists now would say, Yes, it was, it was absolutely the, the asteroid that knocked off the dinosaurs. Or some would say, well, they were having a little trouble, and then the asteroid kind of gave them the final boot. I actually don't think there's evidence of that. Um, so now we know. And now we know that the circumstances of their demise had nothing to do with them. It wasn't their fault that they went extinct. They got whacked by a rock from space. So it shouldn't tarnish their legacy at all, the fact that they eventually died just like every other living creature does. Yep, I, it's pretty. I like I like your thinking. Um, so, why dinosaurs matter is a new book coming out. I'll go ahead and hold it up again, uh, September nineteenth. But you can order it, pre-order it right now on Amazon. That's right. And I actually just had the privilege of skimming it today. I didn't really get to read the whole book, but I, I think I will definitely get a copy. Great. And um, we'll also post a link to your TED Talk. Um, you did a very well-received TED Talk last year, and we will um, add that to the link when we post this video on our Facebook page. And any other final thoughts about the museum or dinosaurs or anything you want to say before we wrap it up? Well, it's been a pleasure visiting, and um, if you haven't been to the Natural History of the Museum, you have to get that. Um, if the, if you haven't been to the Natural History Museum of Utah, you have to get down here. It's an amazing place. You're going to learn a lot. You're going to have a lot of fun. And it doesn't matter where you're from or, or how old you are, um, you're going to enjoy your visit here. Thanks. I appreciate it. You know, 
I always say the same thing, but since I work here, I don't have quite as much credibility. But it really is a pretty neat museum, and it is a privilege to be part of it here. So um, thanks for stopping by today, and thanks for taking the time to, to speak with us. We appreciate it. It's my pleasure, Jim. Thank okay, you. Yeah. <laughs>